All right. So today I'm joined with Michael O'Hanlon. Uh, I thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. And uh, today I wanted to talk to you about your expertise in foreign policy and specifically targeting China and its relationship with the U.S. So first of all, I wanted to ask you, there's been a lot of talk about China and also relating to Taiwan and America's role in the world and whether it's still this great superpower that it once was or whether China's rising up and going to fill that those shoes. And there's a lot of fear around China. And I want to know how much is that merited? How much should Americans be scared of China's growing power as a global influence? Hi, Simon. Well, it's nice to be with you. Thanks for taking the time to have me on your show. And I think people should be very interested in China's rise and somewhat vigilant, but not scared. That would be my short answer. Although there are certain specific issues, and you know, you allude to Taiwan, that one probably in particular, where there is the potential for outright conflict if we really handle it badly on one or both sides. So that's sort of an exception to my overall argument. My, my bottom line view is that China's rise will be concerning. It will not always be comfortable. It will, to some extent, challenge our sense of our own place in the world and our own power, because I think we will have to share that superpower status with another country. I don't think China will overtake us by most measures, certainly not the number of allies. We have, we have 60 allies. China has North Korea. <laughs> so when you look at things that way, or when you consider most of the world's greatest universities are still in the United States, and Chinese recognize that because they send a lot of their best students and the children of their so-called princelings and other leaders to this country to be educated. And we have an English speaking uh, market, which means a lot of people around the world speak our language, which gives us a leg up economically. We have a very strong rule of law. I mean, people make fun of lawyers, and I guess I could tell a lawyer joke now and again myself. But the fact that we have private property and an investment climate where you can reliably put your money and not have it confiscated by the state or some bad actor gives us a huge up over China, for that matter, where the government could always come in at the last minute and decide it wants something you've got. Uh, and so when you add up all these different advantages of the United States, we should not start talking ourselves down from our superpower status, but we probably should get used to sharing it. By the way, just like we did for the first half of my life, because in the Cold War, we were, you know, we were a stronger economy than the Soviet Union, but at the time, uh, we didn't necessarily always know that, and we certainly had to share the status of number one in military power with them. And so I think with China, we can we can get used to this more complex world where we're sharing the pinnacle of international influence and capability. But uh, you know, generally speaking, I think if we can manage the Taiwan problem in particular, that augurs pretty well for avoiding war with China, which is far and away the most important thing. Because if we did have a war with China, it could easily become World War III very quickly or escalate to the nuclear level. So avoiding war has to be seen as mission number one. And I think we sometimes risk losing that in the conversation, partly because we sort of take it for granted. We haven't fought China since the Korean War, which ended in 1953. And we haven't ever fought China over Taiwan, even though we had some crises in the early Cold War over Taiwan. Uh, so, you know, the possibility of conflict has to be our top concern. But the only place where I really think the two sides would be likely to risk it would be if China decided to really try hard to quickly bring Taiwan back into the motherland, so to speak. Chinese considered Taiwan part of the country, unnaturally separated by history, by the Japanese, by the Americans, uh, by all sorts of things, except themselves. They really should blame themselves because the reason why people in Taiwan want to stay independent is they've seen some of the downsides of living under China's rule and what they've also seen what happened recently to Hong Kong. So uh, in that sense, we, we should be especially concerned about Taiwan. But generally speaking, I think this is a competition that we're up for and that could even have some positive benefits for the world if we channel some of our competition into areas like green technologies for you know, uh, solar energy and uh, advanced computational methods, artificial intelligence, advanced biological capabilities. I think a healthy competition, uh, as long as China can be uh, you know, sort of cajoled to play by the rules of respecting intellectual property and putting things to good use, 
uh, competition could be okay and even beneficial in places. So uh, I am not one of these people who loses sleep over China's rise, but I certainly spend a good deal of my waking hours thinking about it and trying to make sure that we can keep this uh, relationship on a stable path. Hmm. Yeah. And can you fill in for many people who don't know what the rise of China looked like? Because obviously China at one point wasn't this great superpower that it is today. Um, and so can you just briefly explain where did China come? Where was China at one point in time and how did it get to where it is today? Well, in the uh, 1950s and 60s, China was one of the poorest countries in the world per capita income to terms and really no better off than the most backward uh, agrarian societies of much of Asia, like North Korea, for that matter, or Vietnam at the time, and uh, had suffered huge losses from famine. Before that, uh, they suffered huge losses from their own civil war and from the Japanese invasion and occupation of the 1930s into the 1940s. And uh, so it was a country that under Mao, Zedong, uh, who was, of course, its first leader of the communist era after 1949, uh, used to talk about how they could, uh, if necessary, eat grass to have enough money to make nuclear weapons, which is almost literally what they had to do at first, and uh, so extraordinarily impoverished. Then, after Mao died and when uh, Deng Xiaoping came into power, and this sort of has now been true for about 40 years, uh, China's been growing at an average annual rate of seven to 10% per year. And in that 10% range, because of compound interest or compounding effect, if you're growing your economy at 10% a year, you're doubling it every seven years. So, uh, and even if you're only growing at 7% a year, you're doubling your economy every decade. So that means since 1980, China has improved its per capita income by something like at least fivefold and now is solidly established in the middle income category of countries with an average per capita income in the general ballpark of $10,000 a year. Although if you adjust that for, you know, it's called purchasing power parity because in certain parts of China, things are a lot less expensive for the same reason that people are not as rich as they are in the United States, then you could probably get that number up to closer to 15,000 per year equivalent. And when you multiply that by 1.4 billion people, you're now up in the same range of the United States in gross domestic product. They have about four times as many people as we do, or maybe a little more than four times as many. And their economy by standard measures is about two thirds as big as ours. But if you adjust for purchasing power parity, it's now slightly bigger than ours. Anyway, bottom line is a country that used to be uh, the average person living off a few hundred bucks a year, is now averaging $10,000 or more per year. And when you go to the coastal parts of China, you know, the Shanghai's, the Shenzhen's, Beijing, um, Tsingdao, uh, and so many other cities, some of them just you know, more or less brand new, you see as many glittering skyscrapers as any place on earth. And you feel like you're closer to a Western level of wealth than you are to anything else. So it's been the re most remarkable rise of a large country in the history of the human race in the last 40 years. Yeah. And then it's also, it's, it's such a weird, almost kind of paradox because you see many of the Western countries, which are these big wealthy countries and they're all relatively free. And then China, which is another rather wealthy country, but it's uh, at least by GDP. And it's just, they're not as, not as free as any of the other uh, countries that it's competing with on that economic level. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. Although China, um, you know, it's giving a different kind of uh, name, different kind of image to an authoritarian command driven state, because, you know, I don't like dictatorship any more than the average American. Uh, and I'm not sure I really call China's system of government dictatorship, because it's really the rule of a party. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if you you know, are born smart and or you show promise in school or whatever, they may bring you into that party and you may have a chance to rise up. And then within that party, it's not exactly a democracy, but it's sort of a meritocracy where to the extent that they're being reasonably fair about how they judge people uh, and evaluate them, then you may be able to rise up and become influential. So it's not as if 
we know who the leader of China of 2050 is already going to be based on the sons of President Xi Jinping or something like that. You know, there is a certain amount of effort within the party system to create and nurture and reward talent. And uh, I don't know if it's going to work forever, and it certainly has its downsides even right now, but in terms of resource allocation, innovation, development, uh, it's, it's working okay for them right now. Yeah. Okay. So now we have all, these, all this context to zero in on the relationship between the U.S. Uh, and China relations. Out of the past, well, actually, no, first of all. Is China's, we have to learn to share the power you were saying, but what is China's, how does China threaten America? Right. Well, first of all, sharing power, uh, I do think we have to share the status of being superpowers. The phrase sharing power, let's come back to that because that's a little bit more in need of, you know, unpacking. I think that what it does not mean, should not mean, is that we sort of concede the Western Pacific region to China because that's their half of the world and this is our half. That's not what I mean by sharing superpower status. I, I want us to use our influence and our leverage and our allies and our own power to require China to accept the world of independent sovereign nation states where they don't get their own sphere of influence. And that essentially the principles that we've built the international order on since 1945 remain. So I don't want to compromise on a lot of that. Uh, there may be areas where we can and should compromise with China, but it's not on the basic way the world operates. It should not be, because I think we have a world system now that's actually helped China enormously. That's what they grew up and grew their economy during this period of uh, rules-based Western uh, sponsored security order and economic order. And they should want to keep it too. They may want to tweak it. They may want to have some more Chinese influence, but we should be trying to uh, push back whenever they try to steer things in a different direction. So in terms of what we should fear, your, your actual question, again, I would say far and away, the most important thing to fear is war. And it's not just because I'm a student of military operations and a national security specialist, but war really is far and away the worst thing we can do to each other, mm -hmm. you know, short of asteroid strike or something, you know, uh, apocalyptic like that. It's the thing that humans do to each other that is the most consequential in a negative sense. And we've done it so many times in our history that we should never assume we've outgrown it. That's the tragedy of the way humans, you know, run the world. And, and there are places where even with China having a meritocracy of government leaders, even with the United States having a democracy, that we could wind up in trouble. And I think, again, the most important is Taiwan because the United States does not have a firm commitment to Taiwan. We don't even recognize them as a country. We do not have a security treaty with them. And yet we want China to think that we might come into a conflict to back up Taiwan and help protect Taiwan if China were to attack it with the goal of reunification. And then the question is, where does that war stop? Because whoever is losing at whatever limited level it begins will have a strong, powerful incentive to expand it. And next thing you know, we could be seeing attacks on each other's homeland and we could see even nuclear threats. So that's number one thing to worry about. And I'm gonna keep saying it for my, not just today, but my, the whole rest of my life, uh, because uh, it's easy to forget sometimes. People th start saying we got, we're competing with China in AI or in, you know, um, this or, or the next cell phone or who has the better app for like, you know, ordering pizza uh, or whatever. And th those things just don't matter as much as peace. Yeah. Uh, so um, that would be the number one thing. Now, number two thing though, I think is that China's economic and political model is not free. And even if it sort of seems to work for them most of the time these days, it's a pretty hard thing to export uh, you know, Winston Churchill once said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. And I think he was right. And of course, what he meant by that is democracy is ugly, but at least we don't put our faith in any one person or party. And we always have a competition of ideas by which we try to improve our governance if we don't like what we've had previously. And we have checks and balances. Democracy is not just going to the ballot box to choose one person or group to be in power. It is also protecting the individual, protecting the rule of law, 
having an independent judiciary that tries to do that. All that is just as important to democracy as elections. And so I don't believe in the Chinese model because they don't have those checks and balances and they don't have elections and they don't have adequate protection you know, for the individual. So uh, I think what they're gonna try to do where they can is to collaborate with other countries that may have authoritarian systems. They're also gonna try to take advantage of the rules of the road to make sure that whatever economic partnerships they enter into are first and foremost good for China. And we've got to keep trying to push back against that so that over time, China becomes a little more like us, not because we are angels, but we recognize that we're not angels. And therefore we Americans have set up this system of checks, balances, and protections that assumes that a lot of bad people out there, some of them, even Americans, will be trying to take advantage of others. And so we need multiple layers of institutions and legal capabilities to ensure that won't happen. And to the extent we can ultimately convince China that they need the same thing, then I don't see there's any particular danger with China becoming roughly comparably powerful to the United States. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that they don't feel that way, then they will be a proponent of authoritarianism, of mercantilism, which means form of economic interaction where you just seek to protect your own state's well-being and power, and you don't really care if you're hurting others. And I, I think that kind of a world is less congenial for us, and it puts more of Asia at risk, maybe even parts of Africa and the Middle East, too. So that would be the other thing that I would uh, worry about with China. Okay, so now to dive into the whole Taiwan problem, because I think that's the main issue surrounding the future relations with America and China, or what the future of the world can hold potentially. So can you briefly give a background of uh, of the whole Taiwan conflict and then also that where it is today and what is the dilemma that we're dealing with? Well, Taiwan, you know, back in the day, previous centuries, was essentially populated by people from the mainland of China, but China itself was pretty weak throughout the 18th and 19th centuries into the 20th century. And, and so the idea that you, know, you had some people living over on this island 100 miles away from the mainland and a pretty decent sized island you know, where you could really have an independent structure of government, um, that was not outlandish. And you know, for the most part, people who lived there governed themselves and the central government didn't really have the power to reach out very much, although they still felt that it was sort of theirs because it was in within the broader confines of the region that China had ruled for not just centuries, but for thousands of years, for millennia. And, and then uh, that was the backdrop going into about, let's say, 1895. Then at that point, Japan went on its spree of conquest, which culminated, of course, in World War II, or the events leading up to World War II in Pearl Harbor. And Japan took Taiwan and ruled it until 1945. And in that period, uh, there was you know, a solidification of the separation of Taiwan from mainland China. Actually, Japan invaded mainland China too, but it didn't control the whole thing quite as easily as it could control a, a, an island. So 1945 comes around and we defeat Japan and we sort of you know, grant Taiwan and its freedom from Japan. But then in 1949, this long-standing civil war in China finally ends and the communists win. And some of the losers, the so-called nationalists, who had been our friends for a while, or at least our frenemies, they, they weren't the greatest, but they were people we were favoring in the internal power struggle within China. They, a lot of them came over to Taiwan, sort of to get away from the victorious communist armies and at that time, military technology did not really provide the capacity for the Chinese communists to come on over themselves, especially initially when they were just consolidating their own control of the country. So you, you had a, now a combination on Taiwan of these refugees from China, essentially political refugees, the losers in the civil war, combined with the existing population, which was also primarily native Chinese by ethnicity, but had been there for decades or centuries. And those became the, the main groups within Taiwan. And the, the ones who fled from China recently sort of took over 
by force. You know, they didn't. They, so they sort of subjugated the pre-existing Taiwan population, and they were not democratic themselves for the 1950s, 60s, 70s into the 80s. So at least they were anti-communists. So we liked them. And when China started to get enough strength to be able to potentially want to take Taiwan back as it saw the goal, the, you know, the reunification goal, they really could not confront the U.S. Navy, even though Taiwan's a lot closer to their shores, a lot further away from ours. But we were so much more powerful than China in the air and on sea that China didn't have the ability to seize Taiwan. Remember, in this time period, China was fighting us very effectively in Korea on the ground. Chinese forces were our main opponent in Korea in, this, in the war there from 1950 to 1953. And we did not win that war. We essentially fought to a stalemate against the Chinese and the North Koreans. So the Chinese were certainly tough, but they didn't have the high technology you really need to win fights in the air and on sea. And so we were able to protect Taiwan for a long time. And again, we maintained it as uh, an ally. We, we treated it as uh, a separate country. In fact, we even treated it as the primary China and we refused to recognize communist China for a long time. So then lo and behold, early 1970s, Henry Kissinger, who by the way, I just saw this week, he's 98 years old, he's amazing, he's still brilliant. <laughs> but he, uh, as the, um, National Security Advisor for President Nixon, and then Nixon himself, they went over to communist China. This is wild. If you saw President Trump negotiating with Kim Jong-un in North Korea the last few years, that was small potatoes compared to Nixon and Kissinger secretly arranging these meetings with Mao, who we had really thought of as almost the devil incarnate in many ways. But Nixon and Kissinger wanted to break China off from the Soviet Union and divide those two communist allies from each other. And so they began a process whereby we sort of cozied up to communist China. And by the end of the 1970s, we had switched allegiances. We broke off our relationship with Taiwan and we recognized the big country, the big China, the mainland, and built diplomatic relations with them as a way to try to splinter China from the Soviet Union and the communist bloc more generally. But um, we still said to Taiwan, don't worry, we'll protect you in a pinch, probably, uh, depending on how a war begins. So that's the history of the last 40 years. And then to fast forward to today, in a sense, we still are living in that world. We still recognize mainland China and Beijing, not Taiwan, as the main government of China. We still believe that the two should be reunited someday. Uh, Obviously, we don't say it this way, but we recognize that whatever happens, mainland China is going to be the bigger part of the union because they've got 1.4 billion people and Taiwan has 23 million. So there's a factor of what, 60 something in disparity, uh, 60 times as many people living in mainland China as Taiwan. Um, and Taiwan now, even though it's a pretty good place to live and wealthier than China per capita, uh, doesn't have the ability to face down China on its own any longer, if it ever did, because China is now a high-tech military power itself with the second largest defense budget in the world after ours. So uh, China now has a lot of weaponry that could threaten Taiwan, that could threaten us if we came to try to protect Taiwan. And the question is, would China consider risking a war in order to pursue its goal of reunifying Taiwan, especially if the Taiwan government does something provocative like declare independence or try to build a nuclear weapon. China has said that if those things happen, it will feel the obligation and the prerogative to use military force. So that's sort of where we are today. Uncertain military balance shifted much more in China's favor, uh, but still unclear who would win at a given level of conflict and therefore raising the prospect that whoever loses at a certain initial level of conflict may escalate to a more general form of warfare geographically and perhaps also up to a nuclear level as well. Wow, all right. So now on the US side, a more recent historical thing or historical perspective on the last three administrations. So the Biden administration, the Trump administration, the Obama, Obama, Obama administration, which what were the aspects of each administration that they did right and did wrong? 
Well, first of all, they all have had a somewhat similar policy where, and this goes back really to, uh, on the Taiwan question in particular, uh, it goes back to the Kissinger, Nixon period, and then the Jimmy Carter presidency, the Ronald Reagan presidency. And the whole idea has always been to try to just sort of sit on the problem, protect Taiwan or make Taiwan feel that you know, America could help if there were a crisis or a conflict, as long as Taiwan itself is not the instigator of the crisis or conflict. Make China feel like we're not promoting independence of Taiwan, which China would find, which Beijing would find unacceptable, but that we want a peaceful resolution and we are perhaps willing to risk American blood in defense of Taiwan if China asserts force. So that's been the basic policy going back now 40 years. And there's not that much difference from one administration to the other. You know, like with everything, Donald Trump always sounded a little different than most presidents. And his rhetoric sometimes got a little bit ahead of himself. But he wound up pulling back his policy to a somewhat similar place to most other or to all other presidents, really, since Nixon, Ford, Carter and Reagan. So uh, that part, you know, I, I have no fundamental complaint, except that I feel as the military balance has shifted, we need new options for how we would respond if China attacked Taiwan, because it's not clear to me that we would win a war. And even if we did, again, win at one level of escalation, the Chinese might then decide because their vision of their own future country is at stake. They see national survival on the line because they see Taiwan as an inherent and important part of their country. So if they're losing that war, they may decide it's worth the risk of escalation. And so I think we need ways to deal with, let's say, a Chinese blockade of Taiwan that would not require us to launch high-end combat operations early on. Uh, I think that could lead to a very bad place. We don't want to take those possibilities off the table altogether, but I think we need more credible options that are sort of rooted in the concept of economic warfare. So that's where I think they've all got it wrong. I don't think there's been enough good thinking in the US government yet about how to do that. And we're seeing a little more sign, sign of that in the uh, Biden administration with a concept that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin calls integrated deterrence, which is also something I've written about. And it combines economic warfare and it combines cyber and allied roles. And it tries to bring in a lot of different concerns that China would have to worry about not just uh, direct American military response if they were to attack Taiwan. So um, I like Austin's idea. Let's see if the rest of the Biden administration really pushes it. The more general question of how are they all doing on China policy, maybe that's where you want to go next. So I'll take a breath and, and see uh, what you want to put on the table after that. No, no, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty good. But I wanted to know... Uh... There's obviously we've all we're talking about this whole issue of Taiwan, and the reason why we're talking about it is because of there's many things that have been going on surrounding China and Taiwan that have not happened in the past. It seems like such as the increased military presence of mainland China surrounding uh, Taiwan airspace and uh, and waters that have been in in the past thought to be quote unquote Taiwan Taiwanese territory. So can you explain what measures China has taken that have been off-putting to the world and that have been unprecedented? Yeah, um, there are a few things and you could call them nibbling around the edges. You could call them uh, coercion, psychological warfare. A lot of what China does, you know, they're just trying to get in the head of leaders in Taiwan. And so every so often they launch a missile close to Taiwan, but they haven't done that much of that lately. They did that in the 1990s. And what they found was that um, it was maybe a, a little thuggish in terms of the reaction it provoked from the United States and from Taiwan. It didn't help them achieve any kind of leverage over Taiwan. And we sent US military forces nearby to respond. So. More recently, they've been doing things like uh, flying their airplanes over the halfway line between China and Taiwan and just sort of nibbling along the edges of that traditional air defense space where the two sides 
uh, you know, draw a line between their respective areas of operations. Or uh, there's something called an air defense identification zone, which is, you know, just a protected airspace, controlled airspace around a country's borders where you would normally have to tell a given country you were flying by just for reasons of air traffic control and safety. And China has now extended its own claims about air defense identification zones, you know, closer towards Taiwan, or it's been willing to fly its airplanes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. So it's just a lot of this kind of stuff. They do the same thing with boats. They, they have exercises nearby that are growing in size and frequency that look like mini amphibious assaults that could put the fear of God into Taiwan, that maybe China's gearing up to do the real thing that uh, the Taiwan fears most and forcibly seize the island. By the way, that would be a daunting mission in the era of modern precision strike weaponry. Very hard to bring big ships into a predictable location near somebody else's coastline. But if China were to do that in conjunction with cyber attacks and attacking command and control centers within Taiwan and other things that would be designed to disrupt and you know confuse, maybe, just maybe, they could pull it off. So they're doing more things that make Taiwan worry they might be getting ready for such an actual attempt. And they declared, uh, they put, passed some legislation that sort of created laws that would not allow Taiwan to do anything uh, to pursue independence. Of course, that didn't really change much because Taiwan doesn't exactly respect China's laws, doesn't consider itself to be under Chinese rule. But for China, it was just one more step towards basically saying, remember, we still uh, haven't lost our conviction that you're part of us and that someday you will be reunified. And uh, at some day, some point, we may figure out a tougher, more forceful means of achieving that, whether it's an outright invasion, a blockade, or just economic strangulation. You know, the, the two sides interact so much in the modern era, they, they didn't used to. But now they interact so much, there's a lot of Taiwan money and technology on China and vice versa. And China could cut that off. It would hurt China some, it would hurt Taiwan a ton. So in that sense, they've got a lot of tools that they could use to ratchet up the intensity and the, the uh, impatience of their effort to reunify the country as they define it. And they want Taiwan to always wonder, you know, what might happen tomorrow? What might happen next month? What might happen next year? And they're hopeful that at some point, the Taiwan people or Taiwan leaders will look for some kind of a face-saving compromise that would achieve this reunification and just give Taiwan, you know, a few of the trappings of autonomy but basically concede the game rather than face the prospect of, of even more uh, intense economic or military conflict. So that seems to be the game they're playing. But again, a lot, just a lot more military activity in the airspace and the seas uh, around Taiwan. Hmm. And w before I go on to the next thing, you said something really interesting about how China was passing legislation about uh, saying basically, don't forget you're, you're still going to be with us one day again uh, or you still are in that weird sense but and taiwan doesn't respect any of that uh, to my to my knowledge but so how are they not independent they are seem like they already are independent legislatively and through their all their systems of government but they haven't actually explicitly said we're independent so can you just explain that how that works well yeah i mean they they rule themselves and they have their own military but they don't have an embassy in Washington. In fact, I think only about 15 countries in the world recognize Taiwan. And here's a really sort of weird, bizarre thing. We get upset whenever another country around the world decides to recognize Beijing, mainland China, rather than Taiwan, because Taiwan and China both agree you can only recognize one of us. And most countries recognize the big China, mainland China including the United States. But we still try to convince other countries to maybe recognize Taiwan. So there's this strange dance that goes on where we ourselves are asking countries to do something that we chose not to do any longer 40 years ago. 
Does uh, anyone, what countries do recognize Taiwan as the real it's, it's It's mostly small countries where Taiwan can essentially buy loyalty by providing enough economic assistance that, you know, like an island nation, I, I, I'm forgetting which 15, uh, I would you know, Google the countries where that recognize Taiwan, but it's going to be mostly small island nations in the Pacific. It's going to be a few smaller nations in South America. Uh, I don't remember if there are any in Africa still, but it's mostly countries that are small enough that if Taiwan promises them, you know, $500 million a year in aid, that that could be enough to persuade them to uh, be friendly to Taiwan. Of course, China could always try to outbid, and now China has a lot more resources. So that is sort of a losing game. And in that sense, I, I don't know how many countries will continue to recognize Taiwan in the future. But Taiwan does not get a seat at the United Nations. They don't get major diplomatic representation around the world. They don't have votes in most international bodies. And so they, at home, within their own island, governing themselves, yeah, it's pretty much like an independent country. But in terms of how they're recognized on the world stage, it's not. And all right. And then here's here's the question of the hour that everyone has been thinking throughout, throughout the past like year to year and a half, two years. What is the possibility of an actual manned traditional invasion of Taiwan? And also, has China ever attempted anything like this in the past? Uh, no, China's never done a huge amphibious assault. And in fact, most countries haven't. We sort of perfected it in World War II, and it was tough then. And, you know, if you go back and read the preparations for D-Day in Europe, where the Germans couldn't really know where we were coming ashore, and we owned the air by that point in the conflict, and we had a huge military stationed in England, and the Brits came over with us as well, and the Canadians, and uh, all those advantages, still it was tough. And the Germans did not have anything like precision strike weapons. They had to basically wait for our silhouettes to emerge on the early morning sky coming in off the water. For Taiwan, they would have all sorts of advantages with radar, anti-ship missiles, and maybe help from us. So that's why I think uh, they have a good chance to fend off that kind of an invasion, but China wants to get in their head and make them think that you know, it's not, China's not just going to come over and present targets uh, and leave Taiwan at its leisure to pick off those targets one by one. China's going to do things like attack all the major, uh, you know, command centers and communications hubs and radar sites and probably try to use computer viruses to shut down any systems that it can't physically destroy. And then they're going to try to do some faking Taiwan out, pretend they're going to one part of the island, but then go somewhere else. And then they're going to want to, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe wait for weather conditions that would make it hard for Taiwan to relocate its forces within the island once they realize that there's some kind of, you know, so maybe right after a typhoon or something. Uh, and if China were to do all those things and also possibly attack American positions in the Western Pacific on Okinawa and Japan, any aircraft carriers they can find in the region, if all that happens perfectly, maybe China has a chance to then sort of sneak ashore and create an initial toehold where Taiwan can't really see them coming, can't reposition forces to counter that, and ultimately has to uh, make do with whatever small number of forces it has in position already. And now those forces are cut off from uh, information about where the incoming Chinese threats are, unless they can actually see them with their own eyes. So if Taiwan leaves itself vulnerable to that kind of an attack, then there's a chance China could pull it off. And then what, what is the actual likelihood of something like that happening? And also, what should be, what would be the consequences of China? What would be the consequences of the rest of the world's reaction? towards something like that? Well, I think the chances are relatively modest because, you know, it's not a very elegant solution. It could fail. And uh, China winds up with, you know, dozens of ships sunk and thousands of its own troops and tens of billions of dollars of its own military equipment destroyed. 
And also it will have revealed itself to be a bully and an aggressor on the world stage, which may lead to a lot of, you know, even intensification of the kinds of responses we're already seeing where the United States is trying to reduce its economic coupling to China. So I don't think the chance is that high. I would like to make it even lower. And so I've been doing some writing with co colleagues who are military specialists about the kinds of systems that we could deploy in the Western Pacific that would make it even harder for China to do this. Basically, things that are hard for China to see and sink in advance. So unmanned underwater vehicles, roving teams um, that don't need runways to launch unmanned aircraft from various kinds of rocket tubes. There are things we can do with modern technology to be able to uh, you know, shoot at incoming Chinese amphibious ships if they ever try to take Taiwan. But I really don't think China is very likely to do that because again, the, the stakes would be so high, the consequences of failure or even of success would be so great. So I think they're more likely to try something like a blockade where they can just sink the occasional ship, try to save the crew. You know, you only kill a few dozen people maybe, use a lot of cyber and a lot of other attacks to um, make Taiwan worry that its economy is not gonna be left alone. Maybe destroy some cranes at ports so Taiwan can't uh, continue its commerce. It depends on trade for two thirds of its GDP. So I think China is much more likely to go after, essentially go after Taiwan's economy with a blockade plus these other kinds of limited strikes rather than to try to do an invasion. Even that attack is pretty unlikely. I would put it in the range of, I don't know, a few percent a year. Hmm. The problem really? is that, yeah, but that, well, per year, you know, yeah. so if we, if we play out through the whole 2020s, maybe it's 10, 20% total. But even that's enough to make me pretty nervous because once that conflict begins, I don't know where it stops. And I think it could involve the United States. Yeah. So this is why I'm spending a lot of my time, like a lot of other American defense strategists these days on the US-China relationship, because even that level of risk is too great. What is the, mo well, if that's roughly 20%, you say, or something like that in the next decade. I mean, I'm, I'm making that number I, yeah. up, but let's, let, let, let's say, any. I would say it's anywhere from five to 20% over a decade. Other people might put it at 20 to 50, uh, but whatever you, you conclude, it's still, when you think about the possibility this could lead to nuclear war, yeah, that's really too high. Even my numbers are scary high. Mm -hmm. And I can't shake the sneaky suspicion that, that, it, that this might have something to do, and you can maybe uh, point out the, uh, the what's wrong with this theory, but it, that it has might some, something to do with the trade of Taiwan. How ta Taiwan controls, like, or ha is the main produ producer of semiconductors and everything. Does that have anything to do with it at all? Well, you're right. That is a reason why we really would prefer that Taiwan not be under China's control. Historically, we've said, hey, we're good with whatever outcome as long as it's peaceful. Mm -hmm. And we've always assumed that Taiwan wouldn't be suckered into a bad deal. So they would ensure themselves some degree of political protection, human rights protection. And it's a small island. So historically, you know, even when they were making television sets in the 60s and starting to get their economy going pretty good, we always figured there were other places to make television sets. But today they make a substantial fraction of the world's semiconductors. And if China were to own that, China would get a huge leg up. It would also get a closer access point for sending ships and submarines out into the Western Pacific. And so you were right to point out that we would prefer that Taiwan not be included within China for those reasons. And that's become a growing consideration. But we're still, we're still sort of stuck with the original position, which is our longstanding claim that as long as reunification happens peacefully, we're not going to object because we don't really have the right to object any more than China has the right to decide how the United States gets along with Puerto Rico or Hawaii or Texas. And so uh, in that regard, we're sort of counting on the people of Taiwan to do the heavy lifting for us and prevent reunification, which is something that a growing number of American strategists would prefer never to see. I'm okay with reunification. And I think we could adjust to this new semiconductor reality by building more production sites here and in Mexico and in Canada and you know the Philippines. In fact, some of that's already happening. And so I think we could live with that personally. And I, I feel that before Hong Kong, before the whole situation where 
China basically took legal ownership of over Hong Kong in a sense. It, it might have been possible a, a peaceful reunification, but I'm not sure how much Taiwan would agree to someone saying, "Oh, you can come over. We can reunify one country, two systems." Do you think? Do you think that's a possibility still? I think you're right that what's happened in Hong Kong is going to make people on Taiwan far more wary, even than they might have been before. I'm not sure how much they really needed the warning, because <laughs> I haven't really seen that many trends in Taiwan in, in my adult lifetime in favor of near-term reunification with China. There are some people, and if you look at polls over the years in Taiwan, there's always been some people who say, well, maybe someday we'll figure it out. I'm not against the idea in principle, but I don't really want it now. And there are people who would prefer independence. Then there are people who think, well, it better be a long time. And it's going to require a lot of change within China. And so all of those groups are basically against near-term reunification. And today they are together, when you combine them, by far the overwhelming majority. How close so, would they be to independence? There are some people in Taiwan who favor outright independence, but it's, it's not the majority either. I don't remember the numbers, but bottom line is, I would say maybe, you know, probably no more than 10 to 20 percent of Taiwan residents really want independence, at least anytime soon. But if you gave them the choice between Taiwan independence or near term reunification with China, the overwhelming fraction would be in favor of retaining their autonomy. So in if you phrase the choice that way, they'd want independence before reunification. But I think the, the majority of them are prepared to just be patient and just say, let's let it play out as long as you don't require me to live under Beijing's rule anytime soon. So you're right, those kinds of trends and sentiments have been reinforced by the Hong Kong experience, where China you know, took back this city from Britain, which had basically stolen it um, you know, a couple hundred years ago, and finally was persuaded to give it back. And China said in the process of that negotiation, you know, back in the 90s, by which they got, tie, got Hong Kong back, we'll keep, it, so, we'll keep it sovereign and separate and free for a half century. Don't worry. And then they basically broke their word after about 20 years, and they've clamped down on anything like democracy in Hong Kong. And, and it's doubtful whether a lot of the other liberties will remain. So, you know, China broke its word in a situation where it had no particular reason to, because it's not as if people in Hong Kong were clamoring to create some kind of a big democracy movement in mainland China. They were just happy to have their own personal freedoms to which they had become accustomed. And so China sort of revealed itself to be a bit of a bully and a bit of a betrayer of its own promises in that situation. And I think that has reinforced the skepticism of many people on Taiwan who were already, to repeat and conclude, already against the idea of any near-term reunification. It, if China wanted forceful reunification, if, either by like a, like a military in, uh, like invasion or, or something, like, something like that we were talking about, or a blockade of some kind, something kind like that, what should the American response be to that? Yeah, maybe this is a good place to wrap up because it is sort of the logical final question, uh, apart from how we can defuse the crisis. But I've, I feel that if the blockade scenario comes to pass, the one that I told you I think is more likely because it's not a you know complete roll of the dice. You're not gambling the whole uh, crown jewels on this one operation that could easily fail with great loss of life on both sides. Blockade is a little bit more adjustable, it's a little bit more subtle, but it still targets the Taiwan economy very strongly. And I think that rather than try to sort of break the blockade by force, by sending a lot of aircraft carriers and ships and submarines and planes to create a protected shipping zone east of Taiwan, which I think would be sort of the natural traditional response, that we might wanna begin by trying to embargo and boycott trade with China and maybe even interfere with China's ability to get oil and gas from the Middle East. So maybe we take our military assets out to the Indian Ocean and start you know, trying to interfere with, uh, ideally with minimal loss of life, I'd maybe even non-lethal weapons, but prevent some of those ships from heading where they're going 
and then try to negotiate a compromise with, with China, try to figure out some way that this whole thing can be defused, because neither side's going to really have it within its power to win that war, and both should be very nervous about how it could escalate. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think that is a good place to stop. Uh, do you have any, thank you so much for coming on here. I really, really appreciate it. The talk was amazing, very enlightening. Do you have any social medias or anything like that that you want to mention? Oh, thank you. Uh, Michael E. L. Hanlon is my Twitter handle. So all one word, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-E-O-H-A-N-L-O-N. And where can people read more about what you your work is? Brookings.edu, although our website is a little bit of a, a melange of a lot of different stuff. So sometimes it's easier. I mean, you can just Google me or Google me with a given topic, and that might be the simplest. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Michael. This was a pleasure and I cannot wait to maybe talk about it again sometime. It was a very, a lot of fun. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Simon. Have a great weekend. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.